This is Chapter 27, Protocols for Prevention and Control of Dental Caries. Dental caries, as you know, is an infectious and transmittable disease. It's also preventable. If a caries infection occurs in the oral cavity, strategies need to exist to control the disease, reverse it to its early stages, and prevent further infection. So you, as the dental hygienist, have new information from current research to share with your patients to increase their understanding of the dental caries process as well as disease prevention. On the tooth surface, a constant process of demineralization and remineralization is ongoing, and this process takes place throughout the life of the tooth. So protocols exist to address the caries disease prevention and management at various stages of lesion development, and the goal is to halt and control the disease process. The basic caries process starts when certain acetogenic bacteria in dental biofilm acting to metabolize the fermentable carbohydrate ingested by the patient. And acids are formed that in turn act to demineralize the enamel, cementum, and or dentin and lead to a cavity formation. Now in chapter 35, if you look on chapter or in figure 35-4, uh, it shows the interrelation of the microorganisms, the tooth, the salivary factors, as well as cariogenic foods in the caries process. And also you need to be uh, familiar with the terminology uh, to describe caries in box 27-1. So let's start with talking about acetogenic bacteria. There are specific bacteria in biofilm on the tooth surfaces that metabolize acid from the fermentable carbohydrates ingested by the individual. And although there are many acid-forming bacteria present, there are two primary groups of bacteria that predominate in the caries process. One is the uh, mutans streptococci, which includes both streptococcus mutans and streptococcus sobrinus and the lactobacillus species. There's also bifid bacteria that are also associated with childhood caries. But the mutant streptococci are infectious organisms that colonize the teeth and help form the dental biofilm through their ability to create a sticky environment for their survival and multiplication. So mutant streptococci and the bifidobacteria are most active during the initial stages of demineralization and cavity formation, but the lactobacilli are more active during the progression of the cavity. And permanent colonization of a child's teeth with the mutant streptococci uh, can take place soon after tooth eruption. Transmission of the acid-forming microorganisms is usually from close family, family members, particularly the mother or primary caregiver. Commonly, consumed fermentable carbohydrates include sucrose, glucose, fructose, as well as cooked starch. Acids produced during the metabolic process include the acetic, lactic, formic, as well as propionic acids. And frequent ingestion of fermentable carbohydrates can have a strong influence in the amount of acid produced, as well as the extent of tooth destruction. The acid formed passes freely into the tiny diffusion channels between the enamel rods or the exposed root surface. And the acids can dissolve the enamel crystals into calcium and phosphate ions. And the subsurface initial Carious lesion uh, is formed, is shown in figure, uh, in chapter 36 and figure 36-3, and it's observed clinically as a white area. The process of demineralization and remineralization are natural processes as the fluids in the oral cavity constantly strive to maintain some sort of equilibrium. Demineralization is the process uh, by which minerals of the tooth structure are dissolved into solution by the organic acids produced from the fermentable carbohydrates by the acetogenic bacteria. 
and with repeated bathing of the tooth surface with the acids produced during the course of the day, the tooth demineralization can actually outpace the remineralization process. And the end product of this activity is the cavitated carious lesion. Smooth surface carries in pits and fissure carious lesions can result when cariogenic nutrients are available. Remineralization is the process of moving minerals back into the subsurface of the enamel. Saliva provides protective factors to promote remineralization. Um, protective factors of the healthy saliva can balance or reverse the destruction of the tooth surface. So saliva has many properties and functions. One is to buffer the acids. Uh, it can also supply minerals to replace calcium and phosphate ions dissolved from the tooth during demineralization. Low saliva flow or xerostomia reduces that buffering capacity in the acids in the demineralization process. So maintaining a neutral or basic saliva pH is necessary to maximize remineralization. And critical pH uh, we discussed in Chapter 18, especially the root carry section. But exposure to topical fluoride can increase the availability of salivary levels of fluoride. And fluoride accumulation in saliva comes from many sources, including water and toothpaste. Uh, Fluoride mechanisms um, of action, it does inhibit demineralization. Fluoride available in the biofilm in saliva can flow into the enamel diffusion channels in the root surface and attach to the form of, in the form, excuse me, of hydrogen fluoride as the oral environment attempts to achieve some sort of equilibrium. And this enhances remineralization. So sufficient saliva is really an integral um, part of the remineralization process. The buffering process or properties of saliva can neutralize acid pH. And this change in pH can reverse the equilibrium, driving calcium, phosphate, as well as fluoride into the tooth surface. And the resulting fluoroapatite bond that is actually stronger than the hydroxy appetite bond, resulting in a stronger tooth surface. Fluoride also inhibits bacterial growth. In the biofilm, the um, hydrogen fluoride diffuses through the cell membrane of acetic bacteria. And inside the cell uh, is disassociated, and the fluoride ions interfere with the essential enzyme activity within the bacterial cell wall. There are some um, dental caries diagnosis and detection that we've discussed already. Uh, formally termed as dental caries, um, that term only referred to the destruction or the destructive lesion of the tooth structure that penetrated the tooth surface and created a cavity. But dental caries made its way through um, enamel and into the dentin or through the cementum and then into the dentin, which is root caries. And diagnosis meant um, detection of decay with loss of tooth substance. When unrestored, dental caries continued into the pulp, created a toothache, and required a root canal treatment or extraction. And patients went for their dental hygiene, so-called recall, regularly just to find new cavities. Now that dental caries is treated as an infection, the end stage of the infection is the hole or the cavity that requires therapy for uh, the restoration. But the diagnosis of dental caries as an infection has really transformed what formerly was detection of cavities to be filled to the identification of each stage of the disease process. So early diagnosis and detection of the caries lesion while still in the subsurface, incipient, or non-cavitated state, allows the clinician to really educate the patient, provide strategies, and perform preventive treatments that can reverse the lesion. So some of the prerequisites for caries, uh, carious lesion detection, adequate lighting, uh, sharp eyes, or magnification loops, Blunt probes, again, no sharp explorers because the remineralizing 
um, surface can't be scratched or altered in any way. You need a water syringe for viewing the teeth when they're when they're wet. Um, and current diagnostic light wing radiographs can um, be useful as well to detect proximal carious lesions, but generally don't detect early remineralized lesions. And vertical bite wings are the most effective for root carious detection. All right, let's talk about the initial infection, which is the invisible lesion. When the strep mutans and other acetic bacteria affects the tooth surface, it clings to the smooth surface, it's creating a biofilm, and it's producing an acid from the available fermentable carbohydrates. And the acids produced diffuse through the microchannels between the enamel rods and dissolves the tooth minerals and creates the subsurface of the lesion. And then you've got your white area lesion, which is an early stage. So the initial stage is invisible, and the early stage is a white area lesion. And from examination, you can run a blunt probe uh, gently over the surface, and by blowing air under a bright light, it can show the white area of the subsurface demineralization. The appearance is dull, but the surface is still smooth. An examination um, needs to be done carefully because you can't uh, break or scratch that outer surface. So picking or scratching a mineralizing uh, surface can actually prevent further mineralization. The mean remineralization process starts with the buffering properties of the saliva, including calcium, phosphate, and fluoride. Then you've got your white area, which is a later stage called the white spot lesion. And from examination, you can run a blunt probe gently over the surface with no pressure. Uh, the appearance is dull. The surface may be slightly rough, indicating the beginning of breakdown, but again, you don't want to scratch the surface. Remineralization may still be effective and allowed to continue. Uh, the final stage is the cavitated lesion, and that is an open lesion that can be observed directly. And an open lesion has no intact tooth surface over the, the surface. Gentle air uh, may be sufficient to clear loose biofilm and debris for better direct vision. Uh, as far as instrumentation, you want to avoid picking or scratching the surface. Bacteria can actually spread from the lesion to an uninfected tooth surface that way. So the probe or the explorer is not needed for visual examination of a cavitated lesion. Small proximal caries that the contact area may need uh, radiographs for confirmation. So radiographic examination includes horizontal bite wing views, which are primarily used for the proximal surface, vertical bite wings for uh, proximal surface as well as root caries detection, especially for the periodontally involved individuals. Um, early caries not extending into the dentin uh, radiographically, they can't reveal the true depth because of the tooth density, but large open lesions really don't need radiograph examination for detection. So you as the dental hygienist can detect carious lesions. Typically the dentist diagnoses uh, the caries, but we do the initial exam. In the early half of the 20th century, the history of dental caries management included the placement of restorations, uh, removing diseased teeth, as well as providing prosthetic replacements. Uh, with the reduction in caries incidence from 40 to 60 percent since 1945 in the United States um, were observed for those fortunate enough to live in communities with fluoridated water. And as the 20th century progressed, a continued drop in dental caries prevalence was generally related to widespread home use of fluoride toothpaste as well as mouth rinses and professional topical applications of solutions, gels, and then finally varnishes. 
And then in the early 21st century, studies showed caries prevalence has remained the same and even increased in some populations of the United States. So dental caries is still a major problem in the health and welfare of adults, adolescents, as well as children. Some current principles in caries management is um, determined, you want to determine the current status of the dentition, including the restored and unrestored surfaces. So charting includes existing restorations, including the sealants, capitated carious lesions, which as you know is the final stage of the carious disease process, secondary or recurrent carious lesions, and sealants in need of repair. Uh, you want to be looking for white spot lesions or demineralized areas that can benefit from remineralization. Radiographically detected or detectable carious lesions want to determine the areas that require restoration. And those are the active carious lesions that need to be charted. And then the dentist can determine the restorative intervention. You're also determining the area that requires remineralization. And um, with that, oftentimes there's a remineralization program or protocols that your office can initiate. So you want to explain the need and discuss the process of remineralization with, with the patient and apply the principles of motivation, motivational interviewing to assess the patient's understanding and gain the patient's acceptance. They have to buy into the process. So you want to prepare and explain risk assessments for the individual. With the patient, uh, the select and then demonstrate procedures um, will be catered to that individual patient. You want to plan for evaluation and reevaluation at the continuing care appointments. So you want to look at the risk factors. And risk factors are habits, behaviors, lifestyles, or conditions that, when present, increase the probability of any disease occurring. So if you look on Table 27.1, uh, the risk factors, uh, you apply primarily for the adult to teenage patients. And then in Chapter 50, uh, we'll get into other things uh, for the teenager and the child, or the younger child, excuse me. But caries management begins with a risk factor assessment, and you're going to be doing that on each and every one of your patients. This allows you, the clinician, to provide individualized recommendations. So you've got the caries risk assessment. And there are several caries risk assessment tools that aid in the systematic collection of the data. Uh, some of the purposes and uses for the individual patient, uh, the risk assessment is using the patient's own list of risk factors that can be of significance uh, for their education. We want to discuss existing individual oral conditions with the patient. We want to provide factual information about the development and transmissibility of cariogenic bacteria, as well as relate the patient's cavitated carious as well as white spot lesions to behavior and lifestyle habits that will need to change in order to improve the balance between remineralization and demineralization. So we're talking about the caries risk assessment, and there are, again, several tools available. You want to encourage the um, patient to apply caries preventive strategies to family and other closely related individuals as well as applying principles of motivational in interviewing. But we're going to be uh, their guide for the management of caries prevention. So we want to identify and evaluate the risk factors, medications, that the patient uh, might be taken to promote, that promotes dry mouth, uh, systemic factors that might affect oral health, uh, the patient's perception of the need may be seen in past dental experiences, family, as well as cultural influences. And the value placed on oral health can be um, detected by understanding the patient's perspective on appearance, cost, personal time involved, and their overall attitudes. And past dental experience, as shown by primary prevention, like have they taken advantage or been able to get sealants? 
secondary prevention? Do they have restorations in the mouth that have been kept up? And tertiary prevention, uh, have they had tooth extractions? And if they have, have they replaced the teeth? We want to find out about the fluoride history. Um, are they using fluoridated water at home? Is it available in the community water supply? Um, other exposures to fluoride, including toothpaste use over the years, as well as professional applications. Uh, talk to them about the success in changing habits, such as uh, the person who was a tobacco user and was able to uh, quit smoking completely. So you want to have a patient-centered interview. So you want to briefly introduce a checklist to show the current daily care and fluoride history. And on uh, box 27-2, uh, may initiate a conversation to stimulate interest with the patient. But it also includes a brief food diary. And chapter 35 goes into more detail about that, which is uh, the food diary specifically, but you're talking about the frequency uh, of fermentable carbohydrate exposure with the patient. Do they snack? Do they snack frequently? What do they snack with? So the preparation and procedure for introducing a protocol for caries prevention and management with the emphasis on remineralization of early non-cavitated lesions can really lay the groundwork for a successful program. And I have um, had new graduates come back and say that that was one of the first things they've done in their office uh, when they've been a new hire as a new graduate is start some sort of a remineralization protocol. So besides each rich risk factor on the caries risk assessment, um, it allows the patient to identify possible changes to prevent future carious lesions. For systemic disease factors, you want to identify the diseases, the conditions, medications that may contribute to um, a dry mouth. Medically or nutritionally compromised patients may also be at risk for dental caries and need additional preventive measures. So there's something called CAMBRA, Caries Assessment and Management by Risk Assessment. I want to look into risk factors, and risk factors, again, are habits, behaviors, lifestyles, or conditions that, when present, can increase the probability of a disease occurring. And Table 27.1 in this chapter lists risk factors for uh, primarily adults and children. And the caries management begins with the risk factor assessment, and this allows uh, you, the clinician, to provide individualized recommendations. There are several caries risk assessment tools. You want to use the patient's own list of risk factors and discuss existing individual oral conditions with the patient so you're personalizing it to that particular patient. And you provide factual information about the development and transmissibility of cariogenic bacteria as well as relate the patient's cavitated carious and white spot lesions to behavioral and lifestyle habits that may need to be improved or changed so that they can reverse some of this process. So you want to encourage the patient to apply caries preventive strategies to other family members and close, uh, closely related individuals. And you want to be a guide for the management of a caries prevention plan for being able to reverse demineralized lesions. So for the um, identifying and evaluating the risk factors, uh, there's a lot of information that's collected during the patient's medical, dental, and social history interviews. Uh, you're getting a list of their medications that may promote dry mouth, certain systemic factors that uh, might affect oral health, um, arthritis in their hands, for example, might be one of them, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, which is uh, autoimmune, which uh, one of the symptoms is a very dry mouth, as well as other mucous membranes. Uh, you're finding out about the patient perception of need uh, that may be seen in past dental experiences. Uh, you're finding out if the patient places any value on oral health and what their understanding is. 
their past dental experience as shown by both, as we said, the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention strategies that they've had, their fluoride history, and other exposures to fluoride. So all of this is coming through with um, you talking to the patient. So besides the risk factors uh, that we've talked about, it this allows the patient to identify possible changes. Some of the systemic disease factors, um, medically or nutritionally compromised patients may be at risk for dental caries and need additional fluoride and preventive services. Then you're going to be planning the care. And the dental hygienist, you, uh, is challenged to select a management strategy for each individual patient that covers their particular needs. So the care plan will not only need to provide for treatment of existing non-reversible serious lesions, but also provide a framework for changes in personal care that was previously unrealized by the patient so that new lesions can be prevented. And planning care will be individualized depending on the disease risk level, the physical and cognitive abilities of the patient or the parent um, and their desire to change. So a variety of the patients present uh, present for uh, dental hygiene care is going to be very challenging for you. On the one side, there'll be the patient with no current um, dental caries or no new dental caries and has very few questions. And um, on the other, maybe somebody on the opposite extreme where there's need for early recognition of uncontrolled disease and has a lot of capitated lesions. So the recommendations for a specific caries risk depends on if they are a low, moderate, or high risk. So the patients with the low risk, um, primary prevention is the top priority. You want to provide the patient with positive feedback and education. You want to review with the patient the existing habits that um, they have that makes them a low risk and encourage them to continue those habits, as well as recommend routine maintenance appointments, because changes in habits may increase their caries risk. The patient with the moderate risk, caries risk, this patient exhibits factors that uh, increase their risk for developing dental caries, and you want to provide that particular patient, again, with positive feedback and support for the protective factors they currently exhibit like using fluoride toothpaste and drinking fluoridated water, healthy snack choices, chewing sugarless gum or sugar-free gum, xylitol products, those type of things. And you want to work with the patient to guide them to reduce the risk factors, um, such as the acido, uh, acetic beverages, frequent uh, ingestion of fermentable carbohydrates, as well as improved daily biofilm removal. Um, you want to discuss the addition of caries preventive foods in the diet, like nuts, sugar-free yogurt, having cheese after putting something that has fermentable carbohydrates in it to raise the pH level again. You want to uh, help them to increase protective factors uh, by placing sealants, fluoride application, those type of things. Now, the patient that has a high caries risk um, displays active carious lesions uh, that has a history of uh, restorations uh, that need repair, um, and it's been recent that they've had cavities. The nidus of infection needs to be addressed and active lesions need to be restored. So you need to take care of the caries that they have and have the patient understand that it is a bacterial infection and that it can be reduced and controlled with fluoride application, their daily biofilm removal, as well as antimicrobial therapy. So the evaluation and strategies for reducing existing risk factors need to be addressed. And strategies for increasing protective factors are also important. So uh, you want to recommend appropriate maintenance schedules and assess the caries risk at regular intervals as well as review current habits and uh, address habits that need to be changed as needed. 
So there are caries management protocols. And if you look on Table 27.1, it gives examples of recommendations for um, preventive maintenance as well as therapeutic interventions to manage and lower caries risk. Some recommendations or some of the recommended products and protocols require a prescription, while others the patient can um, get over the counter. So recommendations for specific caries risk levels, the patient with low caries risk, again, provide feedback. Always re uh, provide positive feedback. We want to always review what they're doing that is good and uh, have them continue it and have them also maintain regular appointments. Caries with moderate risk, again, provide positive feedback. We want to guide them to reduce what risk factors they have and increase the protective factors. The patient with a high caries risk, we want to remove the nidus of infections, take care of the caries, in introduce fluoride and biofilm control, increase the protective factors uh, such as sealants, and increase their maintenance visits. Recommendations for, um, let me see, caries management protocols. Now, this is something that each office is going to have. So, removing the nidus of infection is really placing, um, as you know, the cavity is the end result of the infection. So, you want to remove what's causing the infection. So, you're looking at the bacteria as an infectious disease. You're trying to control the bacteria and take care of the hole that's in the tooth. So instead of just doing fillings and sending the patient on their way, you are looking into ways to reduce the bacterial infection. That is through fluoride, daily home um, use of their toothbrush, uh, maybe chlorhexidine, which we're going to get into, to again reduce the strep mutans and the amount of bacteria that's in their mouth. So protocols for uh, remineralization. I just lost my train of thought. You're doing um, the restorations, as we said. You're initiating daily preventive measures. Uh, it might be an over-the-counter fluoride, a fluoride rinse, or it might be a prescription fluoride rinse. Uh, dietary modifications to reduce or eliminate as much as possible the fermentable carbohydrate exposures between meals um, as well as at the end of meals and select snacks from non-fermentable carbohydrate foods and again avoid the sweetened beverages. Uh, and finally possibly chewing sugar-free gum at the end of meals especially those that contain xylitol because that can reduce the level of the strep mutans and promote remineralization. The xylitol products, um, the bacteria, thinks that it is a uh, food source, so it tries to ingest and digest the xylitol, which is a um, sugar compound, and it can't metabolize it, so the bacteria literally starves to death. As well as chewing uh, xylitol gum, it increases the salivary flow, which again increases the buffering action of saliva. So professional and prescribed applications of fluoride. Caries management for high-risk patients uh, might also include uh, rinsing with 0.12% uh, chlorhexidine once a day for one minute, one week each month. Chlorhexidine has been shown to reduce the strep mutans. It's highly effective against the strep mutans. A neutral sodium fluoride, the 1.1% Jennifer's, it's a prescription product that's brushed on twice a day for three weeks following the chlorhexidine rinse. It's also being recommended and fluoride varnish applications at each of their dental appointments. So somebody who's at high risk, we're recommending chlorhexidine once a day for one week, as well as the neutral sodium fluoride twice a day for three weeks, and then they go back to the chlorhexidine. Managing dental caries means 
uh, you need to evaluate patient compliance at their regular appointments. So maintenance care planning begins prior to dismissing the patient. Um, you want to review the patient's uh, individualized caries management strategy with them. You want to follow up with the patient through telephone or email messages during the first month. Uh, technology is really allowing us to stay connected with our patients, but you want to continue that relationship and motivation. You want it to customize continuing care intervals, and uh, if the caries disease risk is higher than the risk for periodontal disease, a shorter maintenance interval still is going to be uh, recommended not so much for the perio, but for the caries control and the fluoride application. So motivational interviewing principles apply when evaluating all oral conditions, uh, conditions at their maintenance appointments. Maintenance care appointments include biofilm control check using a disclosing agent and recording the biofilm score. Um, you want to address oral care issues get the patient involved with their plaque index score, uh, clinical detection for demineralized areas, the need for sealants, as well as poor margins on restorations. Uh, radiographs are never routine, as you know, but radiographs are prescribed only when specifically indicated by the level of risk, as well as clinical findings. So you want to discuss details for the uh, continuation of remineralization. Uh, for the patient and know that it's going to be an ongoing process. And you reassess the patient compliance with fluoride therapy, uh, the need for repeated short-term antimicrobial therapy as determined by their current caries risk level as well. So patients with high caries risk who are on the chlorhexidine therapy should be seen for maintenance visits every three months until their caries risk is reduced. Continuing intervals of longer than four months may never be optimal for those patients because the bacterial challenges uh, can really occur at any time. You want appropriate professional fluoride applications as well. And finally, you're going to be documenting everything because caries risk and risk levels need to be documented at each continuing care appointment. We do have a template in our Dentrix for this, and we will be doing that at each of their recare appointments, each of your patients' recare appointments. Uh, utilizing the principles of Canberra, which is caries management by risk assessment, allows um, you to evaluate and document patient progress. This may include the determination for caries risk as well as patient compliance with previously prescribed protocols. Also integral to the uh, Canberra are minimally invasive therapies to control active caries um, and to save the enamel structure. These procedures can be planned by the dentist as part of the caries management plan. But thorough documentation through assessment uh, results, all discussions with the patient, instructions given, and patient responses at each point that are in important. So initial planning, you want to record all instructions and um, surveys that were done, including the analysis of risk factors. You want to note specific oral care and dietary changes that were recommended, as well as follow-up successes noted. And you want to note by phone or email uh, any follow-up messages that you might have done. At continuing care appointments, you want to note uh, the patient comments on individual efforts, their likes, their dislikes, they didn't like the proxy brush, they don't like the taste of this, so they didn't use it, or it was too much trouble, so you can try and implement um, other changes as needed, as well as you will be evaluating the teeth and periodontal tissues at each of their appointments. And um, using the book does recommend a sample of the documentation is the SOAP note format that is found on chapter in Chapter 27, Box 3, Subjective, Objective, Know What SOAP Stands For. And finally, Factors to Teach the Patient. Okay. And this is what we're all about is teaching the patient. We want them to know what causes cavities and how they develop and that early dental caries is not a true cavity, that it is uh, changeable and can be remineralized. 
through proper um, things that the patient can do and the use of appropriate fluoride based um, fluoride based on the risk of dental caries is necessary throughout life. Uh, people still have the idea because of the insurance companies that only children need fluoride and that's not true. And not all adults need fluoride either. Not all adults need x-rays or bite wings once a year. But we want to use the caries risk as a way to customize the treatment that we're recommending for our patients. And we are recommending this for you because, you know, this is what we found out, not that it's been a year and it's time for your x-ray. So that's it for Chapter 27.